my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, Lord Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus' cleansing of the temple comes just after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In those three, three synoptic Gospels, his activism in the temple is pretty much the final provocative act that causes his opponents to decide that the only way to deal with this rabble-rousing rabbi is to get rid of him. And his arrest and trial and crucifixion are the result. In John, however, the one we read today, this story is in the beginning of his ministry. It's immediately following him turning water into wine at the wedding. And John doesn't just give it a different place in the chronology. He also gives us some different symbolism and some different details. In today's reading, Jesus doesn't quote Isaiah and Jeremiah as he does in the other Gospels. He doesn't accuse his opponents of turning the Lord's temple into a den of robbers, which suggests that the main problems are the defrauding of the poor and the corruption of the temple leaders. Instead, today in our reading, Jesus says, Stop making my father's house a marketplace. I think John is using this scene to announce a new era, one in which the grace of God is no longer accessed through sacrifice, through cultic sacrifices. In those days, a sacrifice was necessary if a person wanted to approach God, if a person wanted to approach the temple. In the first chapter of John, we're told that John the Baptist said, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If that's true, then we don't need sacrifices. And, and God will interact with God's people in a whole new way. We're asked to see in Christ God's decision to be accessible and available to us at all times and in all places not just in the temple. And we struggle with this because we believe ourselves to be unworthy. And simply accepting being loved without having earned it, it's not our forte. We've had trouble with that in more than just back in the days of sacrifices. There was a time in the church where we paid money called indulgences to, to free us from our sinful nature, or to get us out of purgatory or a friend out of purgatory into heaven after death. The church has come up with many ways in which we can further earn our way into God's love. But God, through Christ and the Holy Spirit, have never come up with a way that we earn our way into God's love. We live a Christian life in response to God's love, not in an attempt to earn God's love. That's the marketplace theory. Through the act of Christ coming to us on Christmas morning in the life of a human, we are introduced to the heart of God, to a visible word of God, and the unknowable God becomes knowable. And more importantly, approachable, approachable without any type of sacrifice, because the sacrifice has been made. Jesus hints at this sacrifice in today's reading when he talks about the destruction of the temple and the temple being raised up again in three days. And we're told the disciples understand what he's talking about in retrospect. And I don't mean to diminish the other three gospel readings where Jesus' anger is directed at the robbers who discriminated against the oppressed and the poor, forcing them to purchase sacrifices and exchange money at exorbitant rates, rendering them deeply in debt, or often not even allowing them to enter the temple because they didn't have what was necessary is really against all things Christian. Jerusalem is the holy city at that time, and the temple is the holiest place of the holiest city. 
and one would expect it to embody all that is good and all that is godly. Yet Jesus finds the temple experience had become a system of exploitation, and that is not okay. But what I'm saying is that for today, we're going to pay attention to the notion that with Jesus on the scene, all things concerning sacrifice have changed. A sacrifice for all time and for all places and for all people has been made. We do not need to offer a sacrifice in order to have access to God or to God's love. Through Christ and through the Holy Spirit, God is with us. Whether we're in temple or church or in our car or my truck, whether we're at work or at school or in the company of friends and family or desperately alone or in times of joy or in times of sadness, at spiritual high point or at a desert experience of lostness, when we're kneeling in prayer or when we're running errands at the store in these places and more, God is present. God is working with us. He is comforting us and encouraging us and strengthening us and healing us and restoring us and sending us forth. So why should we come to church if God is available and present everywhere? We come to church not because this is the only place that we have access to God's love, but because in church we make the time and we take the time to call upon and to experience God's presence intentionally. And we make the time and we take the time to listen for and to discern God's will for us intentionally. In about an hour, we keep alive our relationship with God through scripture and through music and through words of a sermon and through the creeds and we pray out loud and we pray in our hearts and we hear the sentence, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us, in which we acknowledge Jesus is the Lamb of God and that we no longer need engage in sacrifice. And we respond with the words, therefore let us keep the feast. And we're declaring through those words and through the action of Eucharist that we ourselves desire to be transformed into the image of God. We are saying the sacrifice has been made for each and every one of us and for each and every one of God's beloved children. And God's presence is then set forth into the world through us. We take time through our presence in church to strengthen our ability to recognize what is godly, what is Christian, and what is not. And once we strengthen our awareness, we leave the church more to able to detect and to notice and to pay attention and to revel in and to cherish God's presence in the world. And we find God's presence permeates our lives. Our society is filled with people who say that they are spiritual but not religious. And I think there are also people who are religious but not spiritual. And I think both ends, both of those sides, are lacking in fullness and in wholeness. I think both sides lose out on the abundant life we are intended to have, that Christ says he came to bring us. I think it's easy to be spiritual out on a lake or walking in the woods or sitting on the beach watching the waves roll in, but we are actually called to love one another, not to simply love the solitude of the Holy Spirit without interacting or any kind of conflict or any kind of differences. We are called to work through those and interact and be actively involved and love one another. And likewise, it's very easy to get wrapped up in church activities and church committees and church stuff and to forget the role model that Christ gave us when he left everyone and went off to himself to be in solitude and to pray. That is where we're certain of our call. 
as the old saying goes, we don't want to become so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. <laughs> Church here is meant to be a vocational training center, not a God box. We come here to prepare ourselves to live a Christian life out there. This clearing of the temple is the one time in the gospel where Jesus really loses his cool. And apparently, a Sabbath day only piety or compartmentalizing our faith in a way that renders the temple sacred and the home life secular really pisses him off. Separation of church and state is one thing, but separation of church and life, that brings out the whips. Iona Hope is a mission-oriented, justice-focused church, meaning we are currently operating as a vocational training center. All of our meetings focus on how we can best be Christ's hands and feet in the world. We are intentional in asking God to be present through our liturgy, through our worship service itself. And we come together not only to experience God ourselves, but to also assure every single one of God's children that they are welcome to our family and are part of God's beloved. And I believe there's a strong and sincere desire to see God in the world and in the people around us, and that we come here to do that best. The mission statements here, the vision statements here are clear and strong statements of faith. But today's gospel tells us that even the holiest places of the holy can get off track. That what may have been the best of intentions for providing access to God to everyone can become a marketplace meaning it can turn into treating God like a vending machine where we expect blessings in exchange for our offerings. During Lent, we ask Christ to clear our hearts and our minds as he cleared the temple of anything that stands in our way of knowing God's love fully, that we may continue to follow his way. Amen. <laughs>